book six chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five while the inhabitants of the eternal city were thus agitated more tranquil events were occurring at wittemberg where melanchthon was shedding a soft but brilliant light from fifteen hundred to two thousand hearers who had flocked from germany england the netherlands france italy hungary and greece often assembled around him he was twenty-four years of age and had not taken orders every house in wittemberg was open to this learned and amiable young professor foreign universities in particular ingolstadt were desirous to gain him and his wittemberg friends wished to get him married and thereby retain him among them luther though he concurred in wishing that his dear philip should have a female companion declared openly that he would give no counsel in the matter the task was undertaken by others the young doctor was a frequent visitor of burgomaster crap the burgomaster was of an ancient family and had a daughter named catherine remarkable for the mildness of her dispositions and her great sensibility melancthon was urged to ask her in marriage but the young scholar was buried among his books and could talk of nothing else his greek authors and his new testament were all his delight he combated the arguments of his friends but at length his consent was obtained and all the arrangements having been made by others catherine became his wife he received her with great coolness and said with a sigh god has willed it so i must renounce my studies and my delights to follow the wishes of my friends still he appreciated the good qualities of catherine the disposition and education of the girl said he are such as i might have asked god to give her she certainly deserved a better husband the matter was settled in august the espousals took place on the twenty fifth of september and the marriage was celebrated in the end of november old john luther and his wife came with their daughters to wittemberg on the occasion many learned and distinguished persons were also present the young bride was as warm in her affection as the young professor was cold ever full of anxiety for her husband catherine took the alarm the moment she saw him threatened with even the semblance of danger if melancthon proposed to take any step which might compromise him she urged and entreated him to abandon it on one of these occasions wrote melancthon i was obliged to yield to her weakness it is our lot how much unfaithfulness in the church has had a similar origin to the influence of catherine ought perhaps to be attributed the timidity and fears with which her husband has often been reproached catherine was as fond a mother as any wife she gave liberally to the poor o oh god leave me not in my old age when my hair shall begin to turn grey such was the frequent prayer of this pious and timorous soul melancthon was soon won by the affection of his wife when he had tasted the pleasures of domestic society he felt how sweet they were for he was of a nature to feel them his happiest moments were beside his catherine and her children a french traveller having one day found the preceptor of germany rocking his infant with one hand and with a book in the other started back in surprise but melancthon without being discomposed so warmly explained to him the value of children in the sight of god that the stranger left the house to use his own words wiser than he had entered it the marriage of melancthon gave a domestic hearth to the reformation there was thenceforth in wittemberg a family whose house was open to all those whom the principle of a new life now animated the concourse of strangers was immense melancthon was waited on for a thousand different affairs and his rule was never to deny himself to anybody the young professor was particularly skilful in concealing his own good deeds 
if he had no more money he secretly carried his silver plate to some merchant never hesitating to part with it provided he had the means of assisting those who were in distress hence says his friend camerarius it would have been impossible for him to provide for his own wants and those of his family had not a divine and hidden blessing from time to time furnished him with the means he carried his good nature to an extreme he had some antique medals of gold and silver which were extremely curious one day when showing them to a stranger who was visiting him melancthon said take any one of them you wish i wish them all replied the stranger i confess says philip i was at first offended at the selfishness of the request however i gave them to him melancthon's writings had a savour of antiquity this however did not prevent them from exhaling the sweet savour of christ while it gave them an inexpressible charm there is not one of his letters to his friends which does not contain some very apt allusion to homer plato cicero and pliny while christ is always brought forward as his master and his god spalatin had asked him for an explanation of our saviour's words without me ye can do nothing john chapter fifteen verse five melancthon refers him to luther cur ejam gestum spectante roscio as cicero expresses it and then continues this passage means that we must be absorbed by christ so that it is no longer we that act but christ that liveth in us as in his person the divine had been incorporated with the human nature so must man be incorporated with jesus christ by faith the distinguished scholar's habit was to go to bed shortly after supper and get up to his studies at two or three in the morning during these early hours his best works were composed his manuscripts usually lay on his table exposed to the view of all who came and went so that several were stolen when he had a party of his friends he asked one or other of them before they sat down to table to read some short composition in prose or verse during his journeys he was always accompanied by some young persons with whom he conversed in a manner at once instructive and amusing if the conversation flagged each of them had to repeat in his turn some passage taken from the ancient poets he often had recourse to irony but always tempered it with great gentleness he stings and cuts said he of himself but still without doing any harm the acquisition of knowledge was his ruling passion the aim of his life was to diffuse literature and instruction let us not forget that with him the first place in literature was given to the holy scriptures and only a secondary place to the ancient classics my sole object said he is the defence of literature we must by our example inspire youth with an admiration of literature and make them love it for itself and not for the pecuniary profit which it may be made to yield the downfall of literature involves the destruction of all that is good of religion and morals of things human and divine the better a man is the more ardently does he exert himself in favour of learning for he knows that the most pernicious of all pests is ignorance some time after his marriage melancthon went to breton in the palatinate accompanied by camerarius and other friends to pay a visit to his affectionate mother on coming in sight of his native town he dismounted from his horse threw himself on his knees and thanked god for permitting him to see it again margaret on embracing her son almost fainted with joy she would have had him reside at breton and earnestly entreated him to continue in the faith of his fathers on this head melancthon excused himself but with great tenderness that he might not give offence to the conscientious feelings of his mother he had great difficulty in parting with her and whenever a traveller brought him news of his native town he rejoiced to use his own expression as if he had renewed the joys of childhood such was the character of one of the greatest instruments employed in the religious revolution of the sixteenth century 
the domestic calmness and studious activity of wittemberg was however disturbed by a commotion the consequence of a rupture which took place between the students and the citizens the rector betrayed great weakness one may suppose how deeply melancthon was grieved when he saw these disciples of literature committing such excesses luther felt indignant and had no idea of trying to gain them over by a false condescension the disgrace which these disorders brought upon the university stung him to the heart having mounted the pulpit he inveighed in strong terms against these commotions calling upon both parties to submit to the authorities his discourse produced great irritation satan says he unable to attack us from without is trying to do us mischief from within him i fear not but i fear lest the wrath of god be kindled against us for not having duly received his word during the last three years i have been thrice exposed to great danger in fifteen eighteen at augsburg in fifteen nineteen at leipzig and now in fifteen twenty at wittemberg it is neither by wisdom nor by arms that the renovation of the church will be accomplished but by humble prayers and by an intrepid faith which puts jesus christ on our side o oh, my friend unite your prayers to mine that the evil spirit may not be able by means of this small spark to kindle a vast conflagration End of book six chapter five Book six, chapter six of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. But fiercer combats awaited Luther. Rome was brandishing the sword with which she had resolved to attack the gospel her threatened sentence however so far from dispiriting the reformer increased his courage the blows of this arrogant power gave him little concern he will himself give more formidable blows and thereby neutralize those of his adversaries while transalpine consistories are fulminating their anathemas against him he will with the sword of the gospel pierce to the very heart of the italian states luther having been informed by letters from venice of the favourable reception which had been given to his opinions felt an ardent desire to carry the gospel over the alps evangelists must be found to transport it i wish said he that we had living books i mean preachers and that we could multiply them and afford them protection in all quarters in order that they might convey the knowledge of holy things to the people the prince could not do a work more worthy of him were the inhabitants of italy to receive the truth our cause would be unassailable it does not appear that this project of luther was realized it is true that at a later period evangelists even calvin himself sojourned for a while in italy but at this time the design was not followed out he had applied to one of the great ones of the earth had he made his appeal to men low in station but full of zeal for the kingdom of god the result might have been very different the idea at this period was that everything behoved to be done by governments the association of private individuals by which so much is now accomplished in christendom was almost unknown if luther did not succeed in his plans of spreading the truth in a distant country he was only the more zealous in proclaiming it himself at this time his discourse on the holy mass was delivered at wittemberg in it he inveighed against the numerous sects of the romish church and justly reproached it with its want of unity the multiplicity of spiritual laws said he has filled the world with sects and divisions priests monks and laics have shown more hatred of each other than subsists between christians and turks what do i say priests are mortal enemies of priests and monks of monks each is attached to his particular sect and despises all others there is an end of christian love and unity 
he then attacks the idea that the mass is a sacrifice and has any efficacy in itself the best thing in every sacrament and consequently in the supper is the word and promises of god without faith in this word and these promises the sacrament is dead a body without a soul a flagon without wine a purse without money a type without an antitype the letter without the spirit a casket without its diamond a scabbard without its sword luther's voice however was not confined to wittenberg and if he failed to procure missionaries to carry his instructions to distant lands god provided him with a missionary of a new description the art of printing supplied the place of evangelists the press was destined to make a breach in the roman fortress luther had prepared a mine the explosion of which shook the roman edifice to its very foundations this was his famous treatise on the babylonish captivity of the church which appeared sixth of october fifteen hundred and twenty never had man displayed such courage in such critical circumstances in this writing he first enumerates with a kind of ironical pride all the advantages for which he is indebted to his enemies whether i will or not says he i daily become more learned spurred on as i am by so many celebrated masters two years ago i attacked indulgences but with so much fear and indecision that i am now ashamed of it but after all the mode of attack is not to be wondered at for i had nobody who would help me to roll the stone he returns thanks to prierio ek emser and his other opponents and continues i denied that the papacy was of god but i granted that it had the authority of man now after reading all the subtleties by which these sparks prop up their idol i know that the papacy is only the kingdom of babylon and the tyranny of the great hunter nimrod i therefore beg all my friends and all booksellers to burn the books which i wrote on this subject and to substitute for them the single proposition the papacy is a general chase by command of the roman pontiff for the purpose of running down and destroying souls luther afterwards attacks the prevailing errors on the sacraments on monastic vows etc the seven sacraments of the church he reduces to three that is baptism penitence and the lord's supper he then proceeds to baptism and when discussing it dwells especially on the excellence of faith and makes a vigorous attack upon rome god says he has preserved this single sacrament to us clear of human traditions god has said whoso believeth and is baptized shall be saved this divine promise must take precedence of all works however splendid of all vows all satisfactions all indulgences all that man has devised on this promise if we receive it in faith all our salvation depends if we believe our heart is strengthened by the divine promise and though all else should abandon the believer this promise will not abandon him with it he will resist the adversary who assaults his soul and will meet death though pitiless and even the judgment of god himself in all trials his comfort will be to say god is faithful to his promises and these were pledged to me in baptism if god be for me who can be against me oh how rich the christian the baptized nothing can destroy him but his own refusal to believe it may be that to my observations on the necessity of faith will be opposed the baptism of little children but as the word of god is powerful to change even the heart of the wicked though neither less deaf nor less impotent than a child so the prayer of the church to which all things are possible changes the little child by means of the faith which god is pleased to pour into its soul and so cleanses and renews it after explaining the doctrine of baptism luther employs it as a weapon against the papacy in fact if the christian finds complete salvation in the renewal which accompanies the baptism of faith what need has he of the prescriptions of rome wherefore says luther 
i declare that neither the pope nor the bishop nor any man whatsoever is entitled to impose the smallest burden on a christian at least without his consent whatsoever is done otherwise is done tyrannically we are free of all men the vow which we made in baptism is sufficient by itself alone and is more than all we could ever accomplish therefore all other vows may be abolished let every one who enters the priesthood or a religious order consider well that the works of a monk or a priest how difficult soever they may be are in the view of god in no respect superior to those of a peasant labouring in the field or a woman attending to the duties of her house god estimates all these things by the rule of faith and it often happens that the simple labour of a manservant or a maidservant is more agreeable to god than the fastings and works of a monk these being deficient in faith the christian people is the people of god led away into captivity to babylon and there robbed of their baptism such were the weapons by which the religious revolution whose history we are tracing was accomplished first the necessity of faith was established and then the reformers used it as a hammer to break superstition in pieces they attacked error with that divine power which removes mountains these and many similar passages of luther circulated in towns convents and the country were the leaven which leavened the whole lump the conclusion of this famous production on the captivity of babylon is in the following terms i learn that a new papal excommunication has been prepared against me if so the present book may be regarded as part of my future recantation in proof of my obedience the rest will soon follow and the whole will with the help of christ form a collection the like to which rome never saw or heard before End of book six, chapter six. Book six, chapter seven of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. After this publication, all hope of reconciliation between the Pope and Luther must have vanished persons of the least possible discernment must have been struck with the incompatibility of the reformer's belief with the doctrine of the church and yet at this very moment new negotiations were about to commence in the end of august fifteen hundred and twenty five weeks before the publication of the captivity of babylon the general chapter of the augustins had assembled at eisleben at this meeting the venerable Staupitz resigned his office of vicar-general of his order and Vincislas link he who accompanied luther to augsburg was invested with it suddenly in the middle of the chapter arrived the indefatigable miltitz burning with eagerness to reconcile luther and the pope his avarice and above all his jealousy and hatred were interested eck and his swaggering had galled him he knew that the doctor of ingolstadt had spoken disparagingly of him at rome and there was nothing he would not have sacrificed in order to defeat the designs of this troublesome rival by means of a speedily concluded peace the interest of religion gave him no concern one day by his own account he was dining with the bishop of leipzig after the guests had drunk very freely a new work of luther's was brought in on being opened and read the bishop flew into a passion and the official swore but miltitz laughed with all his heart the reformation was treated by miltitz as a man of the world and by eck as a theologian aroused by the arrival of dr eck miltitz addressed the chapter of the augustines in a discourse which he delivered with a very marked italian accent thinking thus to overawe his countrymen the whole augustine order is compromised by this affair said he show me some method of silencing luther we have nothing to do with the doctor replied the fathers and we know not what counsel to give you 
they found it doubtless on what Staupitz had done at Augsburg when he loosed Luther from his vows of obedience to the order. Miltitz insisted, let a deputation from this venerable chapter wait upon Luther and solicit him to write a letter to the Pope, assuring him that he has never plotted in any respect against his person. That will be sufficient to terminate the affair. The chapter gave their consent and assigned the task of conferring with Luther, no doubt at the nuncio's request, to the ex-vicar-general Staupitz and his successor Link. The deputation forthwith set out for Wittenberg with a letter from Miltitz to the doctor, filled with expressions of the highest respect. "'There is no time to be lost,' said he. "'The thunder already hovering over the head of the reformer will soon burst, and then all is over.' Neither Luther nor the deputies, who concurred in his opinions, hoped anything from a letter to the Pope. That, however, was a reason for not refusing to write it, as it would only be a mere matter of form, and might serve to bring out Luther's rights. This Italian of Saxony, Miltitz, thought Luther, in making this demand, has doubtless his own particular interest in view. Very well, be it so, I will write, as I can with truth, that I have never objected to the Pope personally. I will even endeavour to guard against severity in attacking the Sea of Rome. Still, it shall have its sprinkling of salt. Luther, having shortly after been informed of the arrival of the bull in Germany, declared to Spalatin on the 3rd of October that he would not write the Pope, and on the 6th of the same month published his book on The Captivity of Babylon. Miltitz did not even yet despair of success. His eagerness to humble Eck made him believe an impossibility. On the 2nd of October he had written to the elector in high spirits. Everything will go well, but, for the love of God, delay no longer to order payment of the pension which I have had from you and your brother for some years. I must have money in order to make new friends at Rome. Write to the Pope and do homage to the young cardinals, the relatives of His Holiness, with gold and silver pieces from the mint of your electoral highness, and add some for me also, for I was robbed of those which you gave me. Even after Luther was acquainted with the bull, the intriguing Miltitz was not discouraged, and requested a conference with Luther at Lichtenberg. The elector ordered Luther to repair thither but his friends, and especially the affectionate Melanchthon, opposed it. What, thought they, at the moment when a bull has appeared ordering Luther to be seized and carried off to Rome, to accept a conference with the Pope's nuncio in a retired spot? Is it not evident that, because Dr. Eck, from having too openly proclaimed his hatred, is not able to approach the reformer, the wily Chamberlain has been employed to ensnare Luther in his nets? These fears could not deter the doctor of Wittenberg. The prince has commanded, and he will obey. I am setting out for Lichtenberg, wrote he to the chaplain on the 11th of October. Pray for me. His friends would not quit him. The same day, towards evening, Luther entered Lichtenberg on horseback, amid thirty horsemen, one of whom was Melanchthon. The papal nuncio arrived almost at the same time with only four attendants. Was this modest escort a stratagem to throw Luther and his friends off their guard? Miltitz urged Luther with the most pressing solicitations, assuring him that the blame would be thrown upon Eck and his foolish boastings, and that everything would terminate to the satisfaction of both parties. Very well, replied Luther, I offer henceforth to keep silence, provided my opponents keep it also. For the sake of peace, I will do everything that it is possible for me to do. Miltitz was delighted, and, accompanying Luther as far as Wittenberg, the reformer and the papal nuncio walked arm in arm into this town which Dr. Eck was now approaching, holding menacingly in his hand the formidable bull which was to overthrow the Reformation. "'We will bring the matter to a happy conclusion,' wrote Miltitz forthwith to the elector. 
thank the pope for his rose and at the same time send forty or fifty florins to cardinal quator sanctorum luther felt bound to keep his promise of writing to the pope before bidding rome an eternal adieu he wished once more to tell her important and salutary truths some perhaps will regard his letter only as a piece of irony a bitter and insulting satire but this were to mistake the sentiments by which he was actuated he sincerely believed that rome was to blame for all the evils of christendom and in this view his words are not insults but solemn warnings the more he loved leo and the more he loved the church of christ the more he desired to unfold the full magnitude of the disease the energy of his expressions is proportioned to the energy of his feelings the crisis has arrived and he seems like a prophet walking round the city for the last time upbraiding it for all its abominations denouncing the judgments of the almighty and crying aloud still some days of respite the letter is as follows to the most holy father in god leo the tenth pope at rome salvation in jesus christ our lord amen from amid the fearful war which i have been waging for three years with disorderly men i cannot help looking to you o leo most holy father in god and although the folly of your impious flatterers has compelled me to appeal from your judgment to a future council my heart is not turned away from your holiness and i have not ceased to pray god earnestly and with profound sighs to grant prosperity to yourself and your pontificate it is true i have attacked some anti-christian doctrines and have inflicted a deep wound on my adversaries because of their impiety of this i repent not as i have here christ for an example of what use is salt if it have lost its savour or the edge of a sword if it will not cut cursed be he who does the work of the lord negligently most excellent leo far from having conceived any bad thoughts with regard to you my wish is that you may enjoy the most precious blessings throughout eternity one thing only i have done i have maintained the word of truth i am ready to yield to all in everything but as to this word i will not i cannot abandon it he who thinks differently on this subject is in error it is true that i have attacked the court of rome but neither yourself nor any man living can deny that there is greater corruption in it than was in sodom and gomorrah and that the impiety which prevails makes cure hopeless yes i have been horrified on seeing how under your name the poor followers of christ were deceived i have opposed this and will oppose it still not that i imagine it possible in spite of the opposition of flatterers to accomplish anything in this babylon which is confusion itself but i owe it to my brethren to endeavour if possible to remove some of them from these dreadful evils you know it rome has for many years been inundating the world with whatever could destroy both soul and body the church of rome formerly the first in holiness has become a den of robbers a place of prostitution a kingdom of death and hell so that antichrist himself were he to appear would be unable to increase the amount of wickedness all this is as clear as day and yet o leo you yourself are like a lamb in the midst of wolves a daniel in the lion's den but single-handed what can you oppose to these monsters there may be three or four cardinals who to knowledge add virtue but what are these against so many you should perish by poison even before you could try any remedy it is all over with the court at rome the wrath of god has overtaken and will consume it it hates counsel it fears reform it will not moderate the fury of its ungodliness and hence it may be justly said of it as of its mother we would have healed babylon but she is not healed forsake her it belonged to you and your cardinals to apply the remedy 
but the patient laughs at the doctor and the horse refuses to feel the bit cherishing the deepest affection for you most excellent leo i have always regretted that formed as you are for a better age you were raised to the pontificate in these times rome is not worthy of you and those who resemble you the only chief whom she deserves to have is satan himself and hence the truth is that in this babylon he is more king than you are would to god that laying aside this glory which your enemies so much extol you would exchange it for a modest pastoral office or live on your paternal inheritance rome's glory is of a kind fit only for iscariots oh my dear leo of what use are you in this roman court unless it be to allow the most execrable men to use your name and your authority in ruining fortunes destroying souls multiplying crimes oppressing faith truth and the whole church of god oh leo leo you are the most unfortunate of men and you sit upon the most dangerous of thrones i tell you the truth because i wish your good is it not true that under the vast expanse of heaven there is nothing more corrupt more hateful than the roman court in vice and corruption it infinitely exceeds the turks once the gate of heaven it has become the mouth of hell a wide mouth which the wrath of god keeps open so that on seeing so many unhappy beings thrown headlong into it i was obliged to lift my voice as in a tempest in order that at least some might be saved from the fearful abyss such o leo my father was the reason why i inveighed against this death-giving sea far from attacking your person i thought i was labouring for your safety when i valiantly assaulted this prison or rather this hell in which you are confined to do all sorts of evil to the court of rome were to discharge your own duty to cover it with shame is to honour christ in one word to be a christian is to be anything but a roman meanwhile seeing that in succouring the sea of rome i was losing my labour and my pains i sent her a letter of divorce i said to her adieu rome he that is unjust let him be unjust still and he that is filthy let him be filthy still and devoted myself to the tranquil and solitary study of the sacred volume then satan opened his eyes and awoke his servant john eck a great enemy of jesus christ in order that he might oblige me again to descend into the arena eck's wish was to establish the primacy not of peter but of himself and for that purpose to lead vanquished luther in triumph the blame of all the obloquy which has been cast on the sea of rome rests with him luther narrates his intercourse with de vio miltitz and eck and then continues now then i come to you o most holy father and prostrated at your feet pray you if possible to put a curb on the enemies of the truth but i cannot retract my doctrine i cannot permit rules of interpretation to be imposed on the holy scriptures the word of god the source whence all freedom springs must be left free o oh, leo my father listen not to those flattering sirens who tell you that you are not a mere man but a demigod and can ordain what you please you are the servant of servants and the seat which you occupy is of all others the most dangerous and the most unhappy give credit not to those who exult but to those who humble you perhaps i am too bold in giving advice to so high a majesty whose duty it is to instruct all men but i see the dangers which surround you at rome i see you driven hither and thither tossed as it were upon the billows of a raging sea charity urges me and i cannot resist sending forth a warning cry not to appear empty-handed before your holiness i present you with a little book which has appeared under your name and which will make you aware of the subjects to which i will be able to devote myself if your flatterers permit me 
it is a small matter as regards the size of the volume but a great one in regard to its contents for it comprehends a summary of the christian life i am poor and have nothing else to offer besides you have no want of anything but spiritual gifts i commend myself to your holiness may the lord keep you for ever and ever amen this little book with which luther did homage to the pope was his treaty on the liberty of the christian in which he demonstrates without any polemical discussion how the christian without infringing on the liberty which faith has given him may submit to every external ordinance in a spirit of freedom and love two truths form the basis of the whole discourse that is the christian is free all things are his the christian is a servant subject to all in everything by faith he is free by love he is subject at first he explains the power of faith to make the christian free faith unites the soul with christ as a bride with the bridegroom everything that christ has becomes the property of the believer everything that the believer has becomes the property of christ christ possesses all blessings even eternal salvation and these are thenceforth the property of the believer the believer possesses all vices and all sins and these become thenceforth the property of christ a happy exchange now takes place christ who is god and man christ who has never sinned and whose holiness is invincible christ the omnipotent and eternal appropriating to himself by his wedding ring that is to say by faith all the sins of the believer these sins are swallowed up in him and annihilated for no sin can exist in the presence of his infinite righteousness thus by means of faith the soul is delivered from all sins and invested with the eternal righteousness of jesus christ the bridegroom o oh, happy union jesus christ the rich the noble the holy bridegroom takes in marriage this poor guilty condemned bride delivers her from all evil and decks her in the richest robes christ a king a priest shares this honour and glory with all christians the christian is a king and consequently possesses all things he is a priest and consequently possesses god and it is faith not works which procures him this honour the christian is free from all things and above all things faith giving him everything in abundance in the second part of the treatise luther presents the truth in its other point of view although the christian has thus been made free he voluntarily becomes a servant that he may act towards his brethren as god has acted towards him through jesus christ i desire said he freely joyfully and gratuitously to serve a father who hath thus shed upon me all the riches of his goodness i wish to become everything to my neighbour as christ has become everything to me from faith continues luther flows love to god and from love a life full of liberty charity and joy oh how noble and elevated a life the life of the christian is but alas none know it and none preach it by faith the christian rises even to god by love he descends to man still however remaining always in god this is true liberty a liberty as far above every other species of liberty as the heavens are above the earth such was the treatise which accompanied luther's letter to leo the tenth End of Book 6, Chapter 7。Book 6, Chapter 8 of History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 2, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While the Reformer was thus addressing the Roman Pontiff for the last time, the bull which anathematized him was already in the hands of the germanic church and at luther's own door it would seem that no doubt was entertained at rome as to the success of the measure which had thus been adopted against the reformation 
the pope had charged two high functionaries of his court caraccioli and aleander to be the bearers of it to the archbishop of metz who was requested to see to its execution but eck himself appeared in saxony as the herald and executor of the great pontifical work no man knew better than the doctor of ingolstadt how formidable the blows were which luther had struck alive to the danger he had stretched forth his hand to sustain the tottering edifice of rome in his own estimation he was the atlas destined to support the ancient roman world on his robust shoulders when on the point of falling to pieces proud of the success of his journey to rome proud of the charge which he had received from the sovereign pontiff proud to appear in germany with the new title of proto-notary and pontifical nuncio proud of the bull which he held in his hand and which contained the condemnation of his indomitable rival he regarded his present mission as a triumph more splendid than all the victories which he had gained in hungary bavaria lombardy and saxony and from which he had previously derived so much renown but this pride was soon to be humbled the pope in entrusting the publication of the bull to eck had committed a blunder which was destined to neutralize its effect the proud distinction conferred on a man who did not hold high rank in the church gave offence to sensitive and jealous spirits the bishops accustomed to receive the bulls directly from the pope were offended at the publication of this one in their diocese by an upstart nuncio the nation who had hooted the pretended conqueror of leipzig at the moment of his flight into italy were equally astonished and indignant when they saw him repass the alps decked in the insignia of pontifical nuncio and with the power of crushing whomsoever he chose the sentence brought by his implacable adversary luther regarded as an act of personal revenge he regarded it says pallavicini as the perfidious poniard of a mortal enemy and not as the legitimate act of a roman lictor it was generally viewed as less the bull of the sovereign pontiff than of dr eck in this way the blow was obstructed and weakened beforehand by the very person at whose instigation it was struck the chancellor of ingolstadt had hastened back to saxony which as having been the scene of battle he was desirous should also be the scene of his victory having arrived he published the bull at meissen merseburg and brandenburg towards the end of september but in the first of these towns it was posted up in a place where nobody could read it and the bishops of those three sees were in no haste to publish it even duke george ex great patron prohibited the council of leipzig from making it public before receiving orders from the bishop of merseburg and these orders did not arrive till the following year these are only difficulties of form said john eck to himself at first for everything else seemed to smile upon him duke george sent him a golden cup and some ducats even miltitz who had hastened to leipzig on learning that his rival had arrived invited him to dinner the two legates were boon companions and miltitz thought he could not have a better opportunity of sounding eck than over their wine after he had drunk pretty freely he began says the pope's chamberlain to boast in grand style he displayed his bull and told him how he meant to bring that drolly fellow martin to his senses but the ingolstadt doctor soon had occasion to observe that the wind was veering the course of a year had produced a great change in leipzig on st michael's day some students posted up placards in ten different places containing a severe attack on the new nuncio who in amazement took refuge in the cloister of st paul where tetzel had previously found his asylum and declining every visit induced the rector to call his youthful opponents to account by this poor eck gained little the students composed a song upon him and sang it in the streets eck must have heard it in his prison 
on this all his courage failed him and the redoubtable champion trembled in every limb every day brought him threatening letters one hundred and fifty students who had arrived from wittemberg spoke out boldly against the papal envoy for once the poor apostolic nuncio could hold out no longer i would not have them kill him said luther though i wish his designs to fail eck quitting his retreat at night clandestinely escaped from leipzig to go and hide himself at coburg miltitz who gives the account triumphed more than the reformer his triumph however was not of long duration all the chamberlain's projects of conciliation failed and he came at last to a miserable end one day when drunk he fell into the rhine at mentz and was drowned eck gradually recovered courage repairing to erfurt whose theologians had on more than one occasion betrayed their jealousy of luther he insisted on having his bull published in this town but the students seized the copies tore them to pieces and threw them into the river saying since it is a bull let it swim now said luther on being informed of this the pope's paper is a true bull eck durst not make his appearance at wittemberg but he sent the bull to the rector with a threat that if it was not conformed to he would destroy the university at the same time he wrote duke john frederick's brother and co-regent do not take what i do in bad part i am acting in behalf of the faith and it costs me many cares great labour and much money the bishop of brandenburg supposing him inclined was not entitled to act at wittemberg in his capacity of ordinary the university being protected by its privileges luther and karlstadt who were condemned by the bull were asked to take part in the meetings which were held to deliberate on its contents the rector declared that as he had not received a letter from the pope along with the bull he declined to publish it the university had already acquired greater authority in the surrounding countries than the sovereign pontiff himself its declaration served as a model to the government of the elector and thus the spirit which was in luther triumphed over the bull of rome while the german mind was thus strongly agitated by this affair a grave voice was heard in another quarter of europe an individual foreseeing the immense rent which the papal bull was about to make in the church came forward to give a solemn warning and to defend the reformer it was that of the swiss priest of whom we have already spoken ulrich zwinglius who though not united to luther by any friendly tie published a treatise full of wisdom and dignity the first of his numerous writings a kind of fraternal affection seemed to draw him towards the doctor of wittemberg the piety of the pontiff said he requires that he shall joyfully sacrifice whatever is dearest to him for the glory of christ his king and for the public peace of the church nothing is more injurious to his dignity than to defend it by pensions or terror even before the writings of luther were read he had been calumniated to the people as a heretic a schismatic and as antichrist himself not one gave him warning none refuted him he called for a discussion but all he could get was a sentence of condemnation the bull which is published displeases even those who honour the majesty of the pope for it is everywhere regarded as an expression of the impotent hatred of some monks and not of the mildness of a pontiff who ought to be the vicar of a saviour full of love all acknowledge that the true doctrine of the gospel of jesus christ has greatly degenerated and that a public and thorough reformation of laws and manners is required consider all men of learning and virtue the more sincere they are the stronger is their attachment to evangelical truth and the less their dissatisfaction with luther's writings there is not one who does not acknowledge that he has derived benefit from these books though he may have met with passages which he was unable to approve let men of sound doctrine and acknowledged probity be selected 
let three princes above all suspicion the emperor charles the king of england and the king of hungary name the judges let these judges read luther's writings let them hear his defence and then let their decision whatever it be be confirmed this proposal which came from the country of the swiss led to no result it was necessary that the great divorce should take place it was necessary that christendom should be rent in twain her very wounds were destined to be the cure of her diseases end of book six chapter eight book six chapter nine of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine but what signified all this resistance by students rectors and priests if the mighty arm of charles v is joined to the mighty arm of the pope will they not crush these scholars and grammarians will any one be able to resist the combined power of the pontiff of christendom and of the emperor of the west the blow has been struck luther is excommunicated and the gospel seems lost at this solemn moment the reformer does not disguise to himself the magnitude of the danger to which he is exposed but he looks upward and prepares to receive as from the hand of the lord himself a blow which seems destined to annihilate him he retires within himself and meditates at the footstool of the throne of god what the result is to be says he i know not and i am not anxious to know certain as i am that he who sits in heaven has from all eternity foreseen the beginning the progress and the end of this affair wherever the blow is to strike i am without fear the leaf of a tree falls not without our father's will how much less shall we fall it is a small matter to die for the word since this word which became incarnate and that for us has itself first died if we die with it we shall rise again with it and passing along the same road by which it passed will arrive where it has arrived and remain with it throughout eternity sometimes however luther could not restrain the contempt which he felt for the manoeuvres of his enemies on these occasions he displays his characteristic combination of sublimity and sarcasm i know nothing of eck says he except that he arrived with a long beard a long bull and a long purse but i will laugh at his bull on the third of october he was made acquainted with the papal letter at length says he this roman bull has arrived i despise it and defy it as impious false and in all respects worthy of eck it is christ himself who is condemned it gives no reasons it merely cites me not to be heard but simply to sing a palinode i will treat it as spurious though i have no doubt it is genuine oh if charles v were a man and would for the love of christ attack these demons i rejoice in having to endure some hardships for the best of causes i already feel more liberty in my heart for at length i know that the pope is antichrist and that his see is that of satan himself it was not in saxony merely that the thunders of rome had produced alarm a quiet family of swabia a neutral family saw its peace suddenly broken up Bilibald Pirkheimer of Nuremberg, one of the most distinguished men of his age, having early lost his beloved wife Crescentia, was united in the closest affection with his two young sisters, Caritas, abbess of St. Clair, and Clara, a nun of the same convent. These two pious females served God in solitude, and divided their time between study, the care of the poor, and preparation for eternity bilibald who was a statesman relaxed from public affairs by maintaining a correspondence with them they were learned read latin and studied the fathers but their favourite volume was the holy scriptures 
they had never had any other teacher than their brother the letters of caratus are written in a delicate and amiable spirit tenderly attached to bilibald she took alarm at the least danger which threatened him pirkheimer to dissipate the fears of this timid spirit wrote a dialogue between caratus and veritas charity and truth in which veritas tries to strengthen caratas nothing can be more touching or better fitted to solace a tender and agonized heart what must have been the terror of caratas when the rumour spread that in the papal bull bilibald's name was posted up beside that of luther on the doors of cathedrals in fact eck pushed on by blind fury had associated with luther six of the most distinguished men of germany that is karlstadt feldkirchen and egranus who gave themselves very little concern about it and adelman pirkheimer and his friend spengler whose public functions made them particularly alive to the insult there was great agitation in the convent of st clair how shall the disgrace of bilibald be borne nothing affects relatives more deeply than such trials in vain did the city of nuremberg the bishop of bamberg and even the dukes of bavaria interfere in behalf of spengler and pirkheimer these noble-minded men were obliged to humble themselves before dr eck who made them feel all the importance of a roman protonotary and obliged them to write a letter to the pope declaring that they adhered to the doctrines of luther only in so far as they were conformable to christian faith at the same time adelman with whom eck had once had a scuffle on rising up from table after a discussion on the great question which then occupied all minds was required to appear before the bishop of augsburg and purge himself on oath of all participation in the lutheran heresy still however anger and revenge had proved bad counsellors to eck the names of bilibald and his friends damaged the bull the character of these eminent men and their extensive connections increased the general irritation luther at first pretended to doubt the authenticity of the bull i learn says he in the first work which he published after it that eck has brought from rome a new bull which resembles him so much it is so stuffed with falsehood and error that it might well be named dr eck he gives out that it is the work of the pope whereas it is only a work of lies after explaining his reasons for doubting its genuineness luther thus concludes i must with my own eyes see the lead the seal the tape the conclusion the signature of the bull every part of it in short or i will not estimate all this clamour at the weight of a straw but no man doubted not even luther himself that the bull was the pope's germany waited to see what the reformer would do would he stand firm all eyes were fixed on wittemberg luther did not keep his contemporaries long in suspense on the fourth of november fifteen twenty he replied with a discharge of thunder by publishing his treatise against the bull of antichrist what errors what impostures said he have crept in among the poor people under the cloak of the church and the pretended infallibility of the pope how many souls have thus been lost how much blood shed what murders committed what kingdoms ruined further on he ironically says i know very well how to distinguish between art and malice and set very little value on a malice which has no art to burn books is so easy a matter that even children can do it how much more the holy father and his doctors it would become them to show greater ability than is requisite merely to burn books besides let them destroy my works i desire nothing more for all i wished was to guide men to the bible that they might thereafter lay aside all my writings good god if we had the knowledge of scripture what need would there be for my writings i am free by the grace of god and bulls neither solace nor frighten me my strength and consolation are where neither men nor devils can assail them 
luther's tenth proposition condemned by the pope was in the following terms no man's sins are pardoned if when the priest absolves him he does not believe that they are pardoned the pope in condemning it denied that faith was necessary in the sacrament they maintain exclaims luther that we ought not to believe that our sins are pardoned when we are absolved by the priest what then are we to do listen now o christians to a new arrival from rome condemnation is pronounced against this article of faith which we profess when we say i believe in the holy ghost the holy catholic church and the forgiveness of sins did i know that the pope had really given this bull at rome he did not doubt it and that it was not the invention of the arch liar eck i would cry aloud to all christians that they ought to hold the pope as the true antichrist spoken of in scripture and if he would not desist from proscribing the faith of the church then let the temporal sword resist him even sooner than the turk for the turks allow belief but the pope forbids it while luther was speaking thus forcibly his perils were increasing the scheme of his enemies was to drive him out of wittemberg if luther and wittemberg are separated both will be destroyed a single stroke would thus disencumber rome of both the heretical doctor and the heretical university duke george the bishop of merseburg and the theologians of leipzig were laboring underhand at this work luther on being apprised of it said i leave this affair in the hands of god these proceedings were not without result adrian professor of hebrew at wittemberg suddenly turned against the doctor it required great firmness in the faith to withstand the shock given by the roman bull there are characters which follow the truth only at a certain distance and such was adrian frightened at the condemnation he quitted wittemberg and repaired to leipzig to be near dr eck the bull began to be executed the voice of the pontiff of christendom was not an empty sound long had fire and sword taught subjection to it faggot piles were prepared at his bidding and everything indicated that a dreadful catastrophe was to put an end to the audacious revolt of the augustine monk in october fifteen twenty all the copies of luther's works in the shops of the booksellers at ingolstadt were seized and put under seal the archbishop elector of mentz moderate as he was had to banish ulrich of hutten from his court and imprison his printer the papal nuncios having laid siege to the young emperor charles declared that he would protect the ancient religion and in some of his hereditary possessions scaffolds were erected on which the writings of the heretic were reduced to ashes princes of the church and magistrates were present at these auto da fe alcander was quite elated with his success the pope said he in imitation of precrio may dethrone kings he may if he chooses say to the emperor thou art only a tanner he knows well how to bring one or two miserable grammarians to their senses we will dispose moreover of duke frederick also to hear the proud nuncio one would have said that the pile of mints which consumed luther's books was le commencement de la fin the beginning of the end these flames it was said at rome will carry terror into every quarter such in truth was the effect on many superstitious and timid spirits but even in the hereditary states of charles where alone it was ventured to execute the bull the people and even the grandees often answered these pontifical demonstrations with derision or expressions of indignation luther said the doctors of louvain on presenting themselves before margaret regent of the netherlands luther is subverting the christian faith who is this luther asked the princess an ignorant monk well then replied she do you who are learned and in such numbers write against him the world will credit a multitude of learned men sooner than an isolated ignorant monk the doctors of louvain preferred an easier method they caused a vast pile to be erected at their own expense the place of execution was covered with spectators 
and students and burghers were seen hastening through the crowd their arms filled with large volumes which they threw into the flames their zeal edified the monks and doctors but the trick was afterwards discovered instead of the writings of luther they had thrown into the fire the sermones discipuli tartaret and other scholastic and popish books the count of nassau viceroy of holland when the dominicans were soliciting the favour of burning the doctor's books said to them go and preach the gospel as purely as luther and you will have nobody to complain of at a festival attended by the leading princes of the empire the reformer having become the subject of conversation the baron of ravenstein said aloud in the space of four centuries only one christian man has dared to lift his head and the pope is wishing to put him to death luther conscious of the power of his cause remained tranquil amid the tumult which the bull had excited did you not urge me so keenly said he to spalatin i would be silent well knowing that by the power and counsel of god this work must be accomplished the timid man was anxious for speech the strong man wished to be silent it was because luther discerned a power not visible to the eyes of his friend be of good courage continues the reformer christ began these things and christ will accomplish them though i should be put to flight or put to death jesus christ is present here and more powerful is he who is in us than he who is in the world end of book six chapter nine Book Six, Chapter Ten of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mail d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. But duty obliged him to speak in order to manifest the truth to the world. Rome has struck, and he will make it known how he receives the blow. The Pope has put him under the ban of the Church, and he will put the Pope under the ban of Christendom. Up to this hour the Pope's word had been omnipotent. Luther will oppose word to word, and the world will know which is the more powerful of the two. I am desirous, said he, to set my conscience at rest by making men aware of the danger to which they are exposed at the same time he prepares to renew his appeal to a universal council an appeal from the pope to a council was a crime and hence the mode in which luther attempts to justify himself is a new act of hostility to papal authority on the morning of seventeenth november a notary and five witnesses of whom cruciger was one met at ten o'clock in one of the halls of the augustine convent in which the doctor resided there the public officer sarktor of eisleben having seated himself to draw up the minute of his protest the reformer in presence of the witnesses says with a solemn tone considering that a general council of the christian church is above the pope especially in all that concerns the faith considering that the power of the pope is not above but beneath scripture and that he has no right to worry the sheep of christ and throw them into the wolf's mouth i martin luther augustine doctor of the holy scriptures at wittemberg do by this writing appeal for myself and for all who shall adhere to me from the most holy pope leo to a future universal christian council i appeal from the said pope leo first as an unjust rash tyrannical judge who condemns me without hearing me and without explaining the grounds of his judgment secondly as a heretic a strayed obdurate apostate condemned by the holy scriptures inasmuch as he ordains me to deny that christian faith is necessary in the use of the sacraments thirdly as an enemy an antichrist an adversary a tyrant of the holy scripture who dares to oppose his own words to all the words of god fourthly as a despiser a calumniator a blasphemer of the holy christian church and a free council inasmuch as he pretends that a council is nothing in itself wherefore 
i most humbly supplicate the most serene most illustrious excellent generous noble brave sage and prudent lords charles the roman emperor the electors princes counts barons knights gentlemen councillors towns and commonalties throughout germany to adhere to my protestation and join me in resisting the anti-christian conduct of the pope for the glory of god the defence of the church and of christian doctrine and the maintenance of free councils in christendom let them do so and christ our lord will richly recompense them by his eternal grace but if there are any who despise my prayer and continue to obey that impious man the pope rather than god i by these presents shake myself free of the responsibility having faithfully warned their consciences i leave them as well as the pope and all his adherents to the sovereign judgment of god such is luther's deed of divorce such his answer to the papal bull there is great seriousness in this declaration the accusations which he brings against the pope are very grave and are not made in a spirit of levity this protestation spread over germany and was sent to the leading courts of christendom though the step which luther had just taken seemed the very height of daring he had a still bolder step in reserve the monk of wittemberg will do all that the pope dares to do the son of the medicis and the son of the minor of mansfeld have descended into the lists and in this mortal struggle which shakes the world not a blow is given by the one which is not returned by the other on the tenth of december a notice appeared on the walls of wittemberg inviting the professors and students to meet at nine o'clock in the morning at the east gate near the holy cross a great number of teachers and pupils assembled and luther walking at their head led the procession to the appointed spot how many faggot piles has rome kindled in the course of ages luther desires to make a better application of the great roman principle he only wishes to rid himself of some old papers and the fire he thinks is the fit instrument for that a scaffold had been prepared one of the oldest masters of arts applied the torch at the moment when the flames rose the redoubted augustine dressed in his frock was seen to approach the pile holding in his hands the canon law the decretals the clementines the extravagance of the popes some writings of eck and emser and the papal bull the decretals having first been consumed luther held up the bull and saying since thou hast grieved the lord's anointed let the eternal fire grieve and consume thee threw it into the flames never was war declared with more energy and resolution luther quietly took the road back to the town and the crowd of doctors professors and students after a loud cheer returned with him to wittemberg the decretals said luther resemble a body with a head as soft as that of a maiden limbs as full of violence as those of a lion and a tail with as many wiles as a serpent in all the papal laws there is not one word to teach us who jesus christ is my enemies continues he have been able by burning my books to injure the truth in the minds of the common people and therefore i have burned their books in my turn a serious struggle has now commenced hitherto i have only had child's play with the pope i began the work in the name of god it will be terminated without me and by his power if they burn my books in which to speak without vainglory there is more of the gospel than in all of the books of the pope i am entitled a fortiori to burn theirs in which there is nothing good had luther commenced the reformation in this way such a proceeding would doubtless have led to fatal results fanaticism would have been able to lay hold of it and throw the church into a course of disorder and violence 
but the reformer's grave exposition of scripture had formed a prelude to his work the foundations had been wisely laid and now the mighty stroke which he had just given would not only expose him to no hazard but even accelerate the hour when christendom would be delivered from her chains thus solemnly did luther declare his separation from the pope and his church after his letter to leo he might think this necessary he accepted the excommunication which rome had pronounced it made the christian world aware that there was now mortal war between him and the pope on reaching the shore he burned his ships and left himself no alternative but that of advancing to the combat luther had returned to wittemberg next day the academic hall was fuller than usual men's minds were excited a feeling of solemnity prevailed throughout the audience in expectation of an address from the doctor he commented on the psalms a task which he had commenced in march of the previous year having finished his lecture he paused a few moments and then said firmly be on your guard against the laws and statutes of the pope i have burned the decretals but it is only child's play it is time and more than time to burn the pope i mean he instantly resumed the see of rome with all its doctrines and abominations then assuming a more solemn tone he said if you do not with all your heart combat the impious government of the pope you cannot be saved whoever takes pleasure in the religion and worship of the papacy will be eternally lost in the life to come if we reject it added he we may expect all kinds of dangers and even the loss of life but it is far better to run such risks in the world than to be silent as long as i live i will warn my brethren of the sore and plague of babylon lest several who are with us fall back with the others into the abyss of hell it is scarcely possible to imagine the effect produced upon the audience by language the energy of which still makes us wonder none of us adds the candid student to whom we owe the fact at least if he be not a block without intelligence as adds he in parenthesis all the papists are none of us doubts that it contains the simple truth it is evident to all the faithful that dr luther is an angel of the living god called to feed the long bewildered sheep of christ with the divine word this discourse and the act which crowned it marked an important epoch in the reformation the leipzig discussion had detached luther inwardly from the pope but the moment when he burned the bull was that in which he declared in the most expressive manner his entire separation from the bishop of rome and his church and his attachment to the church universal as founded by the apostles of jesus christ after three centuries the fire which he kindled at the east gate is still burning the pope said he has three crowns and they are these the first is against god for he condemns religion the second against the emperor for he condemns the secular power and the third against society for he condemns marriage when he was reproached with inveighing too violently against the papacy he replied ah i wish everything i testify against him were a clap of thunder and every one of my words were a thunderbolt this firmness of luther was communicated to his friends and countrymen a whole nation rallied round him the university of wittemberg in particular always became more attached to the hero to whom it owed its importance and renown karlstadt raised his voice against the raging lion of florence who tore divine and human laws to pieces and trampled underfoot the principles of eternal truth at this time melanchthon also addressed the states of the empire in a writing characterized by his usual elegance and wisdom it was a reply to a treatise attributed to emser but published under the name of radinus a roman theologian luther himself spoke not more forcibly 
and yet there is a grace in melanchthon's words which gives them access to the heart after showing by passages of scripture that the pope is not superior to other bishops what prevents us says he to the states of the empire from depriving the pope of the privilege which we have given him it matters little to luther that our riches that is the treasures of europe are sent to rome but what causes his grief and ours is that the laws of the pontiffs and the reign of the pope not only endanger the souls of men but utterly destroy them every man can judge for himself whether or not it suits him to give his money for the maintenance of roman luxury but to judge of the things of religion and of sacred mysteries is beyond the reach of the vulgar here then luther implores your faith and zeal and all pious men implore with him some with loud voice and others with groans and sighs remember princes of the christian people that you are christians and rescue the sad wrecks of christianity from the tyranny of antichrist you are deceived by those who pretend that you have no authority over priests the same spirit which animated jehu against the priests of baal urges you in imitation of that ancient example to abolish the roman superstition a superstition far more horrible than the idolatry of baal so spoke mild melancthon to the princes of germany some cries of alarm were heard among the friends of the reformation timid spirits inclined to excessive moderation staupitz in particular expressed the keenest anguish till now said luther to him the whole affair has been mere sport you yourself have said did not god do these things it is impossible they could be done the tumult becomes more and more tumultuous and i do not think it will be quelled before the last day such was luther's mode of encouraging the timid the tumult has existed for three centuries and is not quelled the papacy continued he is not now what it was yesterday and the day before let it excommunicate and burn my writings let it kill me it cannot arrest what is going forward something wonderful is at the door i burnt the bull in great trembling but now i experience more joy from it than from any action of my life we stop involuntarily and delight to read in the great soul of luther all that the future is preparing o oh, my father says he to staupitz in concluding pray for the word of god and for me i am heaved on the billows and as it were whirled upon them war is thus declared on all sides the combatants have thrown away their scabbards the word of god has resumed its rights and deposes him who had gone the length of usurping god's place society is shaken throughout no period is without egotistical men who would willingly leave human society in error and corruption but wise men even the timid among them think differently we know well says the mild and moderate melanchthon that statesmen have a horror at everything like innovation and it must be confessed that in the sad confusion called human life discord even that which arises from the best of causes is always accompanied with evil still it is necessary that in the church the word of god take precedence over everything human god denounces eternal wrath against those who strive to extinguish the truth and therefore it was a duty incumbent on luther a christian duty which he could not evade to rebuke the pernicious errors which disorderly men were circulating with inconceivable effrontery if discord engenders many evils to my great grief i see it does adds sage philip it is the fault of those who at the beginning circulated errors and of those who filled with diabolic hatred are seeking at present to maintain them all however were not of the same opinion luther was loaded with reproaches the storm burst upon him from all sides he is quite alone said some he teaches novelties said others who knows replied luther in accordance with the virtue given him from on high 
who knows if god has not chosen me and called me and if they ought not to fear that in despising me they may be despising god himself moses was alone on coming out of egypt elijah alone in the time of king ahab isaiah alone in jerusalem ezekiel alone at babylon god never chose for a prophet either the high priest or any other great personage he usually chose persons who were low and despised on one occasion he even chose a shepherd amos at all times the saints have had to rebuke the great kings princes priests the learned at the risk of their lives and under the new dispensation has it not been the same ambrose in his day was alone after him jerome was alone later still augustine was alone i do not say that i am a prophet but i say they ought to fear just because i am alone and they are many one thing i am sure of the word of god is with me and it is not with them it is said also continues he that i advance novelties and that it is impossible to believe that all other doctors have for so long a period been mistaken no i do not preach novelties but i say that all christian doctrines have disappeared even among those who ought to have preserved them i mean bishops and the learned i doubt not however that the truth has remained in some hearts should it even have been in infants in the cradle poor peasants mere babes now understand jesus christ better than the pope the bishops and the doctors i am accused of rejecting the holy doctors of the church i reject them not but since all those doctors try to prove their writings by holy scripture it must be clearer and more certain than they are who thinks of proving an obscure discourse by one still more obscure thus then necessity constrains us to recur to the bible as all the doctors do and to ask it to decide upon their writings for the bible is lord and master but it is said men in power persecute him and is it not clear from scripture that persecutors are usually in the wrong and the persecuted in the right that the majority are always in favour of falsehood and the minority in favour of truth the truth has at all times caused clamour luther afterwards reviews the propositions condemned in the bull as heretical and demonstrates their truth by proofs drawn from holy scripture with what force in particular does he now maintain the doctrine of grace what says he will nature be able before and without grace to hate sin avoid it and repent of it while that even since grace is come this nature loves sin seeks it desires it and ceases not to combat grace and to be irritated against it a fact for which all the saints continually do groan it is as if it were said that a large tree which i am unable to bend by exerting my utmost strength bends of itself on my letting it go or that a torrent which walls and dikes cannot arrest is arrested the instant i leave it to itself no it is not by considering sin and its consequences that we attain to repentance but by contemplating jesus christ his wounds and boundless love the knowledge of sin must result from repentance and not repentance from the knowledge of sin knowledge is the fruit repentance is the tree with us the fruit grows upon the tree but it would seem that in the states of the holy father the tree grows upon the fruit the courageous doctor though he protests also retracts some of his propositions surprise will cease when his mode of doing it is known after quoting the four propositions on indulgences condemned by the bull he simply adds in honour of the holy and learned bull i retract all that i have ever taught touching indulgences if my books have been justly burned it must certainly be because i conceded something to the pope in the doctrine of indulgences wherefore i myself condemn them to the fire he also retracts in regard to john huss 
i say now not that some articles but all the articles of john huss are christian throughout the pope in condemning huss condemned the gospel i have done five times more than he and yet i much fear have not done enough huss merely says that a wicked pope is not a member of christendom but i were st peter himself sitting to-day at rome would deny that he was pope by the appointment of god end of book six chapter ten book six chapter eleven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the powerful words of the reformer penetrated all minds and contributed to their emancipation the sparks of light which each word threw out were communicated to the whole nation but a great question remained to be solved would the prince in whose state luther dwelt favour the execution of the bull or would he oppose it the reply seemed doubtful at that time the elector and all the princes of the empire were at aix-la-chapelle where the crown of charlemagne was placed upon the head of the youngest but most powerful monarch of christendom unprecedented pomp and magnificence were displayed in the ceremony charles v frederick the princes ministers and ambassadors immediately after repaired to cologne aix-la-chapelle where the plague was raging seemed to empty itself into this ancient town on the banks of the rhine among the crowd of strangers who pressed into the city were the two papal nuncios marino caraccioli and jerome aleander caraccioli who had previously executed a mission to maximilian was appointed to congratulate the new emperor and confer with him on matters of state but rome had become aware that in order to succeed in extinguishing the reformation it was necessary to send into germany a nuncio specially entrusted with the task and with a character address and activity fitted to accomplish it aleander had been selected this man who was afterwards decorated with the cardinal's purple seems to have been of rather an ancient family and not of jewish parentage as has been said the guilty borgia called him to rome to be secretary to his son the caesar before whose murderous sword all rome trembled like master like servant says a historian who thus compares aleander to alexander the sixth this judgment seems too severe after the death of borgia aleander devoted himself to study with new ardour his skill in greek hebrew chaldee and arabic gave him the reputation of being the most learned man of his age he threw his whole soul into whatever he undertook the zeal with which he studied languages was not a whit stronger than that which he displayed in persecuting the reformation leo x took him into his service protestant historians speak of his epicurean habits roman historians of the integrity of his life he seems to have been fond of luxury show and amusement aleander says his old friend erasmus lived in venice in high office but in low epicureanism he is admitted to have been violent in temper prompt in action full of ardour indefatigable imperious and devoted to the pope Eck is the blustering intrepid champion of the school aleander the proud ambassador of the arrogant court of the pontiffs he seemed formed to be a nuncio rome had made every preparation to destroy the monk of wittemberg the duty of assisting at the coronation of the emperor as representative of the pope was to aleander only a secondary mission fitted to facilitate his task by the respect which it secured to him the essential part of his commission was to dispose charles to crush the growing reformation in putting the bull into the hands of the emperor the nuncio had thus addressed him 
the pope who has succeeded with so many great princes will have little difficulty in bringing three grammarians to order by these he meant luther melanchthon and erasmus erasmus was present at this audience no sooner had aleander arrived at cologne than he proceeded in concert with caraccioli to put everything in train for burning luther's heretical writings throughout the empire but more especially under the eyes of the princes of germany who were then assembled charles v had already consented to its being done in his hereditary states the minds of men were greatly agitated such measures it was said to the ministers of charles and to the nuncios themselves far from curing the evil will only make it worse do you imagine that the doctrine of luther exists only in the books which you throw into the flames it is written where you cannot reach it on the hearts of the population if you will employ force it must be that of innumerable swords drawn to massacre an immense multitude some billets of wood collected for the purpose of consuming some bits of paper will do nothing such weapons become not the dignity either of the emperor or the pontiff the nuncio defended his faggot piles these flames said he are a sentence of condemnation written in gigantic letters and understood alike by those who are near and those who are at a distance by the learned and the ignorant by those even who cannot read but in reality the nuncio's efforts were directed not against papers and books but luther himself these flames resumed he are not sufficient to purify the infected air of germany if they deter the simple they do not correct the wicked the thing wanted is an edict from the emperor against luther's head aleander did not find the emperor so complying on the subject of the reformer's person as on that of his books having just ascended the throne said he to aleander i cannot without the advice of my counsellors and the consent of the princes strike such a blow at an immense faction surrounded by such powerful defenders let us first know what our father the elector of saxony thinks of the affair after that we shall see what answer to give to the pope on the elector therefore the nuncios proceeded to try their wiles and the power of their eloquence on the first sunday of november after frederick had attended mass in the convent of the cordeliers caraccioli and aleander requested an audience he received them in the presence of the bishop of trent and several of his counsellors caraccioli first presented the papal brief milder than aleander he thought it best to gain the elector by flattery and began to laud him and his ancestors in you said he we hope for the salvation of the roman church and the roman empire but the impetuous aleander wishing to come to the point came briskly forward and interrupted his colleague who modestly gave way to him it is to me said he and eck that martin's affair has been entrusted see the immense perils to which this man exposes the christian commonwealth if a remedy is not speedily applied the empire is destroyed what ruined the greeks if it was not their abandonment of the pope you cannot remain united to luther without separating from jesus christ in the name of his holiness i ask of you two things first to burn the writings of luther secondly to punish him according to his demerits or at least to give him up a prisoner to the pope the emperor and all the princes of the empire have declared their readiness to accede to our demands you alone still hesitate frederick replied by the intervention of the bishop of trent this affair is too grave to be decided on the spur of the moment we will acquaint you with our resolution frederick's position was difficult what course will he adopt on the one side are the emperor the princes of the empire and the chief pontiff of christendom from whose authority the elector has as yet no thought of withdrawing 
on the other a monk a feeble monk for his person is all that is asked the reign of the emperor has just commenced and will discord be thrown into the empire by frederick the oldest and wisest of all the princes of germany besides can he renounce that piety which led him as far as the sepulchre of christ other voices were then heard john frederick son of duke john and nephew of frederick the pupil of spalatin a young prince seventeen years of age who afterwards wore the electoral crown and whose reign was marked by great misfortunes had been inspired with a heartfelt love of the truth and was strongly attached to luther when he saw him struck with the anathemas of rome he embraced his cause with the warmth of a young christian and a young prince he wrote to the doctor he wrote also to his uncle soliciting him to protect luther against his enemies at the same time spalatin though indeed he was often very desponding pontanus and the other counsellors who were with the elector at cologne represented to him that he could not abandon the reformer amid the general agitation only one man remained tranquil that man was luther while others were trying to save him by the influence of the great the monk in his cloister at wittemberg thought that the great stood more in need of being saved by him writing to spalatin he says if the gospel was of a nature to be propagated or maintained by the power of the world god would not have entrusted it to fishermen to defend the gospel appertains not to the princes and pontiffs of this world they have enough to do to shelter themselves from the judgments of the lord and his anointed if i speak i do it in order that they may obtain the knowledge of the divine word and be saved by it luther's expectation was not to be deceived the faith which a convent of wittemberg contained exercised its influence in the palaces of cologne the heart of frederick shaken perhaps for an instant became gradually stronger he was indignant that the pope notwithstanding of urgent entreaties to investigate the matter in germany had condemned it at rome on the demand of the reformer's personal enemy and that in his absence that enemy should have dared to publish in saxony a bull which threatened the existence of the university and the peace of his people besides the elector was convinced that luther had been wronged he shuddered at the thought of delivering an innocent man into the cruel hands of his enemies justice rather than the pope such was the rule he adopted he resolved not to yield to rome on the fourth of november when the roman nuncios were in his presence with the bishop of trent his counsellors announced to them on the part of the elector that he was much grieved to see how dr eck had taken the opportunity of his absence to involve in condemnation several persons not adverted to in the bull that it might be that since his departure an immense number of the learned and the ignorant the clergy and the laity had united in adhering to the cause and the appeal of luther that neither his imperial majesty nor any person had shown him that the writings of luther had been refuted and that the only thing now necessary was to throw them into the fire that he moreover demanded a safe conduct for dr luther to enable him to appear before learned pious and important judges after this declaration aleander caraccioli and their suite retired to deliberate it was the first time the elector had publicly declared his intentions with regard to the reformer the nuncios had anticipated a very different result now thought they that the elector by persisting in playing his part of impartiality would expose himself to dangers the full extent of which cannot be foreseen he will not hesitate to sacrifice the monk so rome had reasoned but her schemes were destined to fail before a power to which she had not adverted the love of justice and truth when again before the elector's counsellors 
i would fain know said the imperious aleander what the elector would think were one of his subjects to choose the king of france or some other foreign prince for judge seeing at length that the saxon counsellors were not to be shaken he said we will execute the bull we will prosecute and burn the writings of luther as to his person added he affecting a disdainful indifference the pope has no anxiety to dip his hand in the blood of the wretch news of the reply which the elector had given to the nuncios having reached wittemberg luther's friends were overjoyed melanchthon and amsdorff in particular cherished the most flattering hopes the german nobility said melanchthon will shape their course by the example of a prince whom they follow in everything as their nestor if homer called his hero the wall of the greeks why should not frederick be called the wall of the germans erasmus the oracle of courts the torch of the schools the light of the world was then at cologne having been invited thither by several princes who wished to consult him at the period of the reformation erasmus was at the head of the true middle juste milieu party at least he thought he was but erroneously for when truth and error are in presence of each other the right side is not the middle he was the chief of that philosophical and university party which had for ages aspired to correct rome without being able to do so he was the representative of human wisdom but this wisdom was too weak to repress the arrogance of the papacy the wisdom of god was necessary that wisdom which the world often calls folly but at the bidding of which mountains are crushed erasmus was unwilling either to throw himself into the arms of luther or to seat himself at the feet of the pope he hesitated and often vibrated between these two powers sometimes attracted towards luther and then suddenly repelled towards the pope he had declared for luther in a letter to the archbishop of mentz in which he had said the last spark of christian piety seems ready to be extinguished it is this that has moved luther's heart he cares neither for money nor honour the publication of this letter by the imprudent ulrich von hutten subjected erasmus to so much annoyance that he resolved to act with more prudence in the future besides he was accused of being in concert with luther whose unguarded speeches moreover offended him almost all good people said he are for luther but i see that we are on the highway to a revolt i would not have my name coupled with his it hurts me and does him no good be it so replied luther since it pains you i promise never to mention your name nor that of any of your friends such was the man to whom both the enemies and the friends of the reformer applied the elector aware that the opinion of a man so much respected as erasmus would carry great weight invited the illustrious dutchman to come to him erasmus complied this was on the fifth of december the friends of luther saw this step not without secret apprehension the elector was sitting before the fire with spalatin beside him when erasmus was introduced what think you of luther immediately asked frederick the prudent erasmus surprised at the direct question at first tried to evade it he twisted his mouth bit his lips and said nothing then the elector opening his eyes says spalatin as he was wont to do when speaking to persons from whom he wished a precise answer looked piercingly at erasmus who not knowing how to disembarrass himself at last said half in jest luther has committed two great faults he has attacked the pope's crown and the monk's belly the elector smiled but gave erasmus to understand that he was in earnest then erasmus laying aside his reserve said the source of all this dispute is the hatred of the monks against letters and the fear they have of seeing an end put to their tyranny 
what have they put in operation against luther clamour cabal hatred libels the more virtuous and the more attached to the doctrines of the gospel a man is the less he is opposed to luther the harshness of the bull has excited the indignation of all good men and nobody has been able to discover in it the meekness of a vicar of jesus christ out of so many universities two only have attacked luther and even these have only condemned not convicted him let not people deceive themselves the danger is greater than some suppose things difficult and arduous are at hand to begin the reign of charles with an act so hateful as the imprisonment of luther would be of sad augury the world is thirsting for evangelical truth let us beware of culpably resisting it let the affair be examined by grave men of sound judgment this would be more accordant with the dignity of the pope himself thus spoke erasmus to the elector the reader will perhaps be astonished at his frankness but erasmus knew to whom he was speaking spalatin was delighted and going out with erasmus accompanied him as far as the house of the count of neunar provost of cologne where the illustrious scholar was residing erasmus in a fit of frankness went into his room took up the pen and wrote down the substance of what he had said to the elector and gave it to spalatin but fear of aleander soon took possession of the timid erasmus the courage which he had felt in the presence of the elector and his chaplain vanished and he begged spalatin to send back his too bold writing lest it should fall into the hands of the terrible nuncio it was too late the elector feeling strong in the opinion of erasmus spoke in more decided terms to the emperor erasmus himself strove in nocturnal conferences like nicodemus of old to persuade the counsellors of charles that it was necessary to remit the whole affair to impartial judges perhaps he had some hope of being named arbiter in this cause which threatened to divide the christian world his vanity would have been flattered by the office but at the same time not to lose himself at rome he wrote the most submissive letters to leo who replied in kind terms and thereby put poor aleander to the torture from love to the pope he could have sharply rebuked the pope erasmus communicated the pontiff's letters because they added to his credit the nuncio made a complaint at rome pretend was the answer that you do not observe the naughtiness of that man prudence requires it it is necessary to leave the door open for repentance charles v himself embraced a vacillating system which consisted in flattering both the pope and the elector and in seeming to incline alternately towards the one or the other according to the wants of the moment one of his ministers whom he had sent to rome on certain spanish matters had arrived at the very time when eck was loudly prosecuting luther's condemnation the wily ambassador instantly saw the advantages which his master might derive from the saxon monk and on the twelfth of may fifteen twenty wrote to the emperor who was still in spain your majesty should go into germany and there show some favour to one martin luther who is at the court of saxony and by his discourses is giving much uneasiness to the court of rome such at the outset was the light in which charles viewed the matter his object was not to know on which side truth or error lay or to ascertain what the great interest of germany demanded what does policy require and by what means can the pope be induced to support the emperor this was the whole question and at rome was well known to be so the ministers of charles gave aleander a hint of the plan which their master meant to follow the emperor said they will act towards the pope as the pope acts towards the emperor for he cares not to increase the power of his rivals and in particular of the king of france at these words the imperious nuncio gave vent to his indignation 
what replied he even should the pope abandon the emperor must the emperor abandon religion if charles means thus to take his revenge let him tremble this unprincipled course will turn against himself the imperial diplomatists were not moved by the menaces of the nuncio end of book 6 chapter 11